What is up, grinders? Welcome to the UFC 300. Crunch time before lock. We've made it, boys, finally to UFC 300. None of these Apex cards, none of these watered-down cards, but there's tons of prize pools out there this week. In there, filling fast, guys. Good job. We've done it. But, you know, we needed a little bit more bigger contest uh, sizing, but that's okay. There's plenty of contests still to be filled out there. Stacked card, three five-round fights. Lots to play with, lots to do for your lineups. I will introduce the crew here. We have Squirrel Patrol, as always, and special guest, Billy Ward. Billy, welcome to the show. Tell us a little about yourself. Tell us how excited you are for the card, because I know we all are. And tell us kind of your overall thoughts, because that's really what we're here to do, break this thing down. Yeah, uh, I'm Billy Ward. I cover a lot of MMA stuff over at Action Network. You know, I'm working for the betting site, but my true passion is DFS. Like, I cover some of the Fantasy Lab stuff, too. Love DFS. Think it's a way better product. I'm a former professional MMA fighter. Was not very great. You can look up my record. It was okay. I had my moments. But, you know, far better playing DFS and betting on it than I ever was as a fighter. And excitement level's high. You know, I, I love that it's a card where we care about every fight, both from an entertainment and a DFS standpoint rather than there's a few really exciting cards at the top and then a bunch of crap below it. So that's the kind of fight I like, and I think it makes for a more entertaining DFS slate as well because we could see optimal lineups from all fighters in almost any fight on this card. Yeah, that's the scary part. And I always talk about, you know, once you get these upper echelon fighters that are the best in the world, sometimes that negates itself from a pure macro standpoint, right? You see these more competitive. It means that there's less fantasy value but squirrel i mean you're talking about three hundred thousand dollars for a performance bonus how do you think that's going to come into play and overall thoughts on this whole slate because unfortunately we don't have the 15 fights you know i was hoping they bump it up right where's the 15 fights but 13 fights is fine we have three five rounders yeah and interesting so you bring up a couple of things there the three hundred thousand dollar bonus you know if you saw the press conference dina white was you know taking questions from the crowd and just decided to you know to up the bonus money uh but it, i think it's got a that's a lot of money like this is not a sport where the guys are you know signing you know 150 million dollar contracts and you know they get a fine for a hundred thousand dollars and they don't care uh three hundred thousand dollars is, is a ton of money to these fighters uh so I don't know. I think it does have to affect things. Uh, the, the problem is, from a DFS perspective, breaking that down and figuring out how. Um, I I could see that maybe some fighters, like maybe the uh, Sidi Youssef um, Diego Lopez fight, right? Like maybe that's one where we didn't necessarily expect to finish. Um, if we did expect to finish, maybe a kind of a submission finish. Diego Lopez is kind of famous in DFS for getting the absolute minimum score for a first round win. Got no strikes landed, you know, <laughs> at the 90 point win uh, with a submission. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe he's a little bit more keen to like make it higher, in, you know, higher action on, on the feet. Um, that's probably not the best move for him strategically, but like maybe a slot is I want to get the $300,000 bonus. Um, so maybe it does make some plates more likely to go to a finish. Other fights I could see, like the Max Holloway, you know, Justin Gaethje fight. Um, that's going to be a high volume fight. And maybe that's a fight where they go in for like fight of the night kind of thing. You know, just a high volume war over five rounds. It's projected to go, you know, to go the distance. It's, it's the fight I'm looking forward to the most on the card. I think that yeah. a lot of people are, you know, feel the same way. Uh, and I think it's going to score, you know, an outstanding, uh, you know, it's probably going to have an outstanding score for DFS. Uh, so, yeah, I think the $300,000 bonus impacts things. Uh, I think the three five round fights impacts things, um, and especially with it being only thirteen fights on the card, uh, that's and it, I think it, you know, kind of strangely impacts Bo Nickel maybe more than anybody else, right? Because you see a guy with a you know sixty something, you know, sixty eight percent chance of a first round finish, it's like wow, he's like an auto click. But now, how does that compare to other fights that might have you know five rounds of volume? It's a really interesting card strategically. Oh, 100 percent. When you have the three five rounders, it's important. You know, unfortunately, I was hoping, you know, no people wouldn't realize there's three five rounders because, you know, the BMF title is up for grabs. But hey, they people know and people want to invest into those two guys. And the really there was when it comes to the 300 K, what are your thoughts, Billy? Because personally, on my side of things, I'm looking at it as like a Bobby Green's always going to be a fun fighter and Jim Miller, they're bonus hunters. But I felt like they were kind of like 
not the odd man out, but the more likely to just sit there and try to pot shot and, you know, make his way to a decision win for Bobby. So maybe not the X's and O's, but as a whole, how are your thoughts on the 300 K? Because that one, you know, now becomes a little bit more fantasy relevance, I'd say. In some ways it does, but I'm almost worried about it for some of the lower card fights because they're not going to shoot for takedowns if they're trying to go out there and have a war. So guys like Bobby Green and Jim Miller, you would kind of hope a few more takedowns bump up their points a little bit. But I think it's more relevant for some of these undercard fights. A guy like Sadiq Youssef, 300K, probably five or six X's his salary. Jamal Hill and Alex Pajeda, pay-per-view points for them are worth way more than 300K. So for them, just trying to win the fight is still probably going to be the plan. I've always wondered this about the BMF belt. I have no idea if the defending BMF champ also gets pay-per-view points because technically they're defending champion or we're not treating that as a real belt. So they don't get that, but those guys were going to have that kind of fight anyway. Like neither of those two were going to try to win a boring slow fight. So I'm not as worried about it with them, but it does push me a little bit more towards some of these undercard fighters where 300 K might be life-changing for them. Where for Alex Pajeda, who's getting, you know, a dollar on every pay-per-view sold, he probably doesn't need to worry about that as much. If you saw the weigh-ins, or no, not the weigh-ins, the conference, the press conference, Aljamain Sterling probably was the loudest one when they started doing it. Aljo's like, give me that 300. So, um, yeah, let's just really, we have to start with the three-rounders, then probably pivot to the Bo Nickel thing, because, unfortunately, it's easy to get Bo Nickel into your lineups, guys. And I, I love it and hate it, because I almost wish the dynamic pricing was on this slate, because... Yeah, Bo Nickel, what is he, minus 2,000 now, Squirrel. How are you going to handle this? Because you said it. it's easy to get him in. He's got the safest floor. Um, but it's also like the guy doesn't miss. He's got the style. He's got the grappling. He's got the control time. He's got a quick win potential. He's got everything to score you a million points, and he's easy to get into your lineups. Yeah, so um, you know, I kind of put this in the Discord, uh, but I filled out the expert survey, and there's a question like, "What fight are you most likely to avoid?" And I put the bold steam, and I think the bone nickel fight, you know, because I think Cody Brundage just has such a small percentage chance of winning the fight. Um, but bone nickel is so expensive, and there's a really good chance that even in a first round finish, right? Like, like this card reminds me kind of, I think, is UFC 285 last year, Mike, and that's the the card that you won. Uh, you know, you you won the DFS contest where you had multiple five round fights. We didn't have a lot of like underdogs that had strong, you know, relatively strong win equity. Uh, and you ended up picking Alexa Grasso. Uh, and she actually was the only underdog that won, or I think the only like greater price below 8,000 that won. Uh, you know, so, you know, on that, that kind of card, like Bo Nickel could get priced off the winning lineup. Then I wrote my underdogs article, right? You know, I had picked four, you know, underdogs I thought were relatively strong. And I actually had trouble like narrowing it down to four. I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, maybe we have a few underdogs win. And then, you know, Bo Nickel, if he gets like 100, 105 points, um, you know, that that lands on the winning DFS lineup. Uh, so unlike, you know, the UFC 285, where Bo Nickel got the first round win, got 100 DK points, but he wasn't on the winning lineup because he, he got priced off of it, right? Um, so it's a really difficult question. I think that's the difficult, you know, question of the card. How do you handle Bo Nickel? Mm-hmm. My guess is I'm going to end up right around ownership, maybe under our projected ownership. I think he might come in a little bit below our projected ownership. I think we still might have him at like 45%. I think people are are knowledgeable of you know the fact that he could get priced off. So I'm probably going to be under 45%, but not super under 45%. And I'm, I'm not sure it's any longer the fight I'm most likely to avoid. Billy, how are you? How, how does Bo Nickel bust? Right. I mean, that's the question because he's got the wrestling, he's got control time. He's got probably going to have some pitter patter if he gets that top Mm -hmm. position. How does he bust? I don't think he busts in a vacuum. I think he busts if Wiley Zhang outscores him by 30 points and it's hard to fit both of them. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of the other people in that fight range, like could Kayla Harrison get a million takedowns because Holly Holm keeps getting back up when she throws her and sneak past a first round win from Bo Nickel. That wouldn't shock me. You know, Davey Figgs could come out, knock out Cody Garbrandt real fast. It's not so much about Bo Nickel for me is that you can't play all these people in the top end. What's the? Yep. We've got the ownership projection on each of them, but how many lineups are going to have both Bo and Wiley? Wiley scored almost 200 points in a decision in her last fight. So that really, that really messes with the math a little bit because you really want to play both of them, but it gets pretty ugly if you're forcing both of those and someone from the main event or and someone from the BMF title fight. Like, that gets tricky. So I don't think there's a shot of him 
disappointing you from a score standpoint unless he tears his ACL walking up the stairs. It's but funny. <laughs> we talk if you about get top score. Yeah, exactly. We talk about the, the upper echelon of fighters right away here, you know, 9,100 on up. And those combos, like you said, are going to be the nickel Wiley. So it's almost like if you take a nickel, take a Harrison, first of all, your salary, you're going to be completely different, I think, inherently. Mm -hmm. And then if you take, you know, I think going Harrison and Figueredo here would be a little bit too wild, but, yeah. you know, you get a little too crazy. But you can kind of do whatever you want on this slate because that middle range, let's just pivot right to it. That's where the gold is. I mean, you have five round fights in the middle range. You have, um, you know, uh, some line value at, at this stage. Personally, I'll give you a thought. I love these 8,100 fighters. Um, Squirrel, you can kind of talk to this. We haven't had this in a very, very long time. And then we'll give Billy some some room to to break down this range. But Squirrel, what do you think about having the 8,100 fight back? Because contextually, you have a little bit of line value. You have the upside of Andrade over three rounds. You have the upside of a finish. She's like plus 200, plus 180, I think, last time I looked. How do you handle this? Because Rodriguez could absolutely hurt Andrade. Andrade is a fighter that you know, has in between the ears, I think, struggled a little bit. But her ceiling wins are like 130 points. I really, really personally love Andrade's on this slate. And I love the context that an 8,100 fight is on this slate because technically it's a pick em and you're getting her at what, minus 140? Yeah, exactly. So it's, a, it's an interesting fight because you have to balance projection and win equity versus leverage. I think Jessica Andrade is going to be popular and maybe more popular than we've got her shown here. Uh, I think she's, you know, clear, like she's in a clear situation where she's priced equal with her opponent, but has, is the favorite. Um, and it's not like, it's not a slight favorite. It's not like, Oh, different books. You know, it's, you know, minus 110 versus my whatever, you know, it's, she's like, you know, a clear favorite now. Um, and this is a fight that actually makes me think about the $300,000 bonus because Jessica Andrade fought, not three times, not four times, but five times last year. Um, and, you know, if they asked her why, she said it was it was for the money. <laughs> um, so the, is she somebody that's really going out trying to get a finish here? And then does it actually increase the chances of Marina Rodriguez, you know, getting a finish? I think Rodriguez is not going to be that popular. I think she might be among, like, the least popular fighters on the card. So now you've got a big leverage spot. I think Andrade is somebody that's actually going to fit in well for, like, patch-type lineups. Um, because I think you're, you know, you're gonna go to the super high end, then you might end up stacking two of the three, you know, two of the five round fights. Then you end up with kind of a middle range amount of salary left, and you go, Oh, this is great. I've got like a favorite here with Andrade. Um, and so I think she's gonna be a little bit more popular than we're showing, and that makes Marina Rodriguez kind of interesting for, for tournaments. And I actually think she's somebody I want to be over the field on in tournaments. Um, because I think there's a big leverage spot there. I think Andrade might really be coming out. She's got pretty good odds for like a first round finish. She might be coming out really gunning for that. And then maybe she gets careless too. Um, so I think it's a great fight to target and it's a great fight to target both sides, not just the, just the Andrade side. When's the last time we had the 8,100? I feel like it's been probably eight months, 10 months. It's been a long time. Yeah. It's been a while. So Billy, this is the range. This is the middle range. Talk to me about it. What do you, you know, from Diego Lopez down to that 8,100, what are you thinking here? Because like we talked about that, uh, the 300 K bonus, honestly, I didn't really want a ton of rackets in Prohaska just from a macro standpoint. I thought that could be strategic kickboxing at distance, but now these guys are going to be gunning at each other. There's the finish equity has gone up. Yeah. You know, I, I think I'm one of the few people that plays more DFS cash for MMA than GPPs and Andrade is Andrade is feels like a must in there. Just, you don't get that kind of value anywhere else. I can't really get there on Marina Rodriguez. It's just, she doesn't strike a lot. She doesn't have a high volume, doesn't get enough takedowns. Her She had a knockout in her last fight, but that was against Michelle Watterson, who's 80 years old and, you know, kind of isn't trying that hard anymore. I totally get it from like a strategy standpoint. Can't quite get there myself. I do like the uh, Rackage Prohaska fight. Just there's so much power there. It's going to either be a first round knockout or a fight we're really disappointed in. But I want to be over the field on those guys just because that's a lot of power. I'm pretty heavily on Yuri. I bet Yuri talked about him as a player I like. A lot of line movement Yuri's way, which scares me a little bit because that correlates with ownership, right? So we're going to mm -hmm. see more people on him. But either of those guys could knock each other out like 
right away. Rakic coming back off a torn ACL, hasn't been back in the cage. There's some ring rust. That's one I want a little bit more exposure to than I think most people are going to have, although I'm worried about the ownership with Yeri. Do you think that that main event just sucks in all that ownership around these guys? Because I, my, my thing, Billy, is that you can't, you can't confidently stick the flag in in the main event. It really is a pick em for a reason. And I feel like it, I like that because if it's a tactical three, four round and then a knockout, it might not score well. My only yeah. problem is Jamal Hill's got sneaky scoring ability. The guy's got volume. And Pereira is just going to rely on every round that goes by, Pereira's equity is just going to fall off, I think, mm-hmm. because of his slow pace striking. Would you agree with that? I do. And personally, I'm not even really treating that like a five round fight. Like the other two five round right. fights are both way more likely to actually see the championship rounds. They both have people that score better on like a minute per minute basis without the finish. So that one to me, it's just how would I treat this fight if it were three rounds? I'm not really pivoting off that much because on the Paeta side, he's not doing a lot on a every minute basis. We need the stoppage anyway. So it doesn't really matter that we have extra rounds. And I, I don't know. Is Do you guys think the field is going to very heavily commit to that? Just because it's the main event, you got to play the main event. I do. Unfortunately, or are people going to realize and avoid it? I I think it'll be the lower owned of like the lowest owned of the five round fights, but I still think it might see a little bit more ownership, maybe than it should, considering it's not maybe not really a five round fight. Um, of course, you know all of this is hypothetical until they you know until they start <laughs> fighting, and there's you know this fight can go five rounds too. It's just less less likely to, and I don't think people are gonna, especially because it's the very last fight. I think people are not gonna be thinking of it uh, as like just another fight, and you know it's an exciting fight in terms of the UFC. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think it'll see more ownership than it should. Just want to like chime in because in, in this mid range, something like you know I'm looking up that the um, Yuri Prochaska and um, and Rakic fight. Has about a thirty-five percent chance combined, right, of them ending in the in the first round. Um, same thing with the uh, Hill um, Alex Pereira fight. The Marina Rodriguez Jessica Andrade still has a thirty percent chance of ending in the first round, uh, and I don't think people are going to play it that way. I think it, that's going to that fight is going to see much lower ownership. Uh, so yeah, just something to keep in mind. Like, that's kind of I might take some of the higher ownership right from that from those other two fights and put it into this Andrade Marina Rodriguez fight. Yeah, so that's what my big question was, is who's the odd person out here, out of the favorites from 8,100 to say, I I, I don't even know where to put the cap, maybe 8,700. There's going to be somebody that comes in significantly lower owned. I just feel it, right? I just, the way that you build your lineups, you can go, when Holloway is going to be the highest owned, which we will talk about in a few, uh, of the underdogs sucking all that uh, ownership and allowing you to go up to the top once you grab him, Who's the odd person out? Because I feel like it, it's probably going to be Lopez, isn't it? Isn't it going to be Diego? I mean, Billy, what do you think? Do you mean odd person out in terms of ownership, or who do we yeah. think is a bad Yeah, yeah. There? That's probably going to be, like, not owned where they should be because of lineup building construction. Yeah. I think there's definitely a case for Lopez. I also think Aljo. I don't hear a lot of people too excited to click Aljamain Sterling here. I can see that fight disappointing from a DFS standpoint if he's just grinding for takedowns but only gets one or two, not going to be a great fight. I actually really like him. I'm going to be over the field on Sterling because he could get a ton of takedowns if Cater can get back up, but probably one of those two. And then maybe just some of the Jim Miller hype keeps people away from Bobby Green too, I could even see is Because we all want to click Jim Miller today, right? Like I I don't want to pick against him just from an excitement standpoint. That's funny you say that because I talk about it all the time, Squirrel. When you have a fighter that's going to push a pace, that other fighter usually scores well because they're right there for the scoring purposes. And, you know, if Jim Miller's going out there, Bobby Green, something's got to give. But any idea on what I was saying there about that odd person out? Do you agree? And also Sterling, man, Sterling Boston versus New York. Uh, We got a rivalry back here in the uh, UFC. I'm surprised about the line value and the ownership not following it. Would you agree with that? Uh, through the week, minus 170 now for Aljo. Kind of surprising to me, but I also feel like that fight absolutely could bust. Yeah, so like Sterling has got about the same win probability now as like, as Bobby Green, uh, you know, who's priced a couple hundred uh, ahead of them. And then you know they both have better win odds now than Justin Gaethje. Of course, Gaethje's got the, the five rounds. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of an interesting dynamic there. 
Uh, I, yeah, the Jim Miller thing's interesting. I wrote him up as one of my underdogs. Like, it seems like such a perfect situation. Like, say he gets the win, finishes Bobby Green, gets a 300K bonus, you know, rides off into the sunset and retires. But he said he doesn't want to retire. <laughs> so, I don't know. Like, that whole narrative that I'm picturing in my head of him literally, like, riding off on a horse or something. Like, it's, he doesn't want to retire. Um, yeah, but I'm sure he does still want that $300,000 bonus. We, we have Bobby Green, actually, as one of the best leverage points, um, like, in terms of our optimal stuff. Like, you know, in terms of uh, optimal line of percentage versus projected ownership. And yeah, I agree. Like it might be a fight where both guys are going for that, going for that finish and get a little bit reckless. It's just hard to pick a side. Um, you know, they both priced pretty well, you know, for the, you know, for the odds or whatever. So um, yeah, I don't know. It, that's a really tough one. It's probably a fight I want to be over the field on um, in terms of like odd person outs. We're we talking like in the mid range, like low stone. Yeah. Player? If you want to go from like Turner down, I, I really feel like it could be Andrade or it could be Lopes. Those are the two that are in the back of my head that might be the ones that are kind of, you know, because when you start building and you grab a Max Holloway, a Miller, then you can go right up to the top and grab whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like there's got to be somebody that just, I, I feel guess, it breaks a slate in the middle. I'm guessing of like, that our Sims are maybe right in this case. I don't always yeah. agree, agree with them, right? But I think Bobby Green might be the fighter that ends up being left off, right? Like, are you wanting to pick against Jim Miller here? Like, I'm not. And, you know, Bobby Green had a pretty bad knockout last time out, you know, just four months ago. Um, I'm not sure about him coming back so quickly. <laughs> but, I mean, he can. And, you know, like, he's got what, you know, prior to that fight, had an 128 points, you know, DK performance. Right before that, 108 points, you know, versus Tony Ferguson. Um, I think this could be a pretty good fight with, between him and Jim Miller. Um, you know, Bobby Green's the favorite, but he's not really being treated that way in terms of like DFS ownership. And I feel that same way when I like make my lines, right? Like I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want Bobby Green. Well, yeah, if I put, you know, Jim Miller here, not, now I can upgrade somewhere else. But like, yeah, Bobby Green might end up being the odd fighter out. And you know, that's maybe a situation where it shouldn't be the case. Like maybe we've got a good, good amount of leverage, you know, going over the field on Bobby Green. Not to mention his game logs are terrible, Billy. This guy does not score you points uh, in bunches. But if he's going to have Jim Miller, they're going to throw down. They're going to go for the bonus. That makes sense, 8,600. And, Billy, what do you think about the BMF title? Tell me about this. Give me the X's and O's. Give me give me the goods. Because when you talk about a fight that's going to be super high owned, I don't know if I've ever seen the you know 30%. And then Max Holloway. 50 plus percent at this stage. I mean, that's, that's crazy to me. Like it's wild. It's, it's a first click for a lot of people. Let's just be yeah. honest. Yeah. And I'm, I'm heavily on this fight in general, but Holloway and specifically as well, because you look through some of these cheaper fighters and if you want to stack two, three of the expensive fighters on the slate, there's not really a better person down there in your lineup than Max Holloway. You know, both he and Gaethje average over seven significant strikes per minute. So this fight going long helps it. We were talking about the main event. If that goes four or five rounds, I bet a lot of money that neither of them are in the optimal lineup. You tell me this one goes five rounds, I would bet it all that one of them makes it there because just minute per minute, they're going to be scoring so many points. I get it. I've got no problem playing Holloway. If it were a smaller number of fights on this card, I would suggest even stacking that one in GPPs because mm -hmm. we could see a loser just like we were talking about UFC 285. Someone lose and make the optimal lineup. I think I put in the expert survey that was my hot take that it could be somebody. I don't think it's necessarily Holloway, but out of everyone down there, he's he's the obvious choice. So love the fight, just love the striking pace. Little bit worried about Holloway's chin holding up up at 155. He's been super durable throughout his career, but everybody's durable until they're not. And he's taken a lot of damage. I don't know if you guys remember a couple of years ago, he was like doing interviews on sports center where he seemed like he had post concussion real bad and was kind of out of it. I've been waiting for that shoe to fall on Holloway for a number of years and it hasn't yet, but that makes me a little bit more interested in Gaethje than the field, just because if someone's going to get knocked out quick, it's going to be Max Holloway. Not yeah, is, Gaethje. is that a potential leverage spot squirrel when you just take a naked Gaethje? I mean, the problem with Gaethje is like he always seemingly gets hurt and then, you know, he's stumbling around, he's leg kicking, he's keeping distance, then he just murks somebody. So it, it's a wild fight. It's probably, you mentioned it, the best fight from an entertainment standpoint. How are you going to handle the BMF title? 
Yeah, I'm going to be playing a lot of it. Um, and I've <laughs> made the joke before, and it's come true. That makes it the fight most likely to get canceled, to get get an eye poke, something, you know, like like some kind of disappointment. Cross our fingers. Hope, hopefully it doesn't go that route. Um, I do think there's probably less, like a lower chance of hijinks on this card because all eyes are going to be on this. You know, it's more professional fighters generally than like the last few, you know, fight nights we've had. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think you've got to roster you know, one side of this fight. I'm going to be stacking this fight in a handful of lineups in, in GPPs, uh, even like the higher, higher money GPPs. I think you've got to like at least like what if this is a fight where Max Holloway puts up 70 points in a loss get you know, puts up some kind of absurd, you know, 150 something point score. It's even money, I think, over under four and a half rounds. Uh, and it's high volume. So I don't know. It is, I, it's like the perfect UFC fight for, for DFS scoring. Uh, yep. I don't know. <laughs> I, I think you got to play, you got to pick a side or not, and but play this fight. I mean, I'll, I'll roster more of this fight than any other fight. And I think so will everybody else, but it, it's justified. I mean, they, they have the pace, they have the number of rounds to, to you know rack up those scores um i'm trying i was like literally like brushing my teeth this morning trying to figure out a way like what situation what scenario happens where max holloway wins the fight and doesn't land on the winning line like is it you know maybe some kind of medical disqualification <laughs> you know i don't know like, <laughs> early second round or early third round like medical disqualification i don't know i i i think max holloway you've got to roster him at about his win probability which is at this point over 40 percent um so the, i think the ownership is justified Absolutely. I mean, then there's another five round fight, the women's title, Wiley Zhang versus Yan Zhaonan. Billy, this is a very interesting fight for the context because all the ownership sucking towards Wiley Zhang, right? The Battle of China. She's got takedowns. She's got volume striking. I feel like betting into an unknown. I like betting into an unknown, right? Even for D DFS purposes, right? We both tagged him, being Squirrel and I, on the survey and, uh, sorry, the, the lineup HQ. Yan Zhao Nian is sneaky in DFS because she's got the ability to hurt her opponents. This could be just right off the bat, just a barn burner, right? They could go out there and strike. I think either girl could get finished early and put up a ton of points. And then the ability to score over five rounds, I think it's going to get more and more difficult for Yan to score because she's got to stop those takedowns. That's what this fight comes down to in my mind is if she's able to stop the takedowns, this comes becomes pretty interesting on the feet from an X's and O's and it's seven K. I mean, there's your way to avoid the Holloway ownership. Yeah, I think, it, it depends on how you're building the lineups. Cause if I'm putting Yen in there, I honestly don't think she has a shot to win here. Like it's interesting on the feet. And then one fighter has a massive grappling advantage. And Yen is not like some contender. We've all been clamoring to see, get a title fight. She lost two in a row and then won two in a row. And they're like, uh, we got nobody else around throw Yen in there. Cause they're both Chinese. So not to take anything away from what she's done, but this is not, I don't think anyone's even arguing. These are the two best 115 pound women in the world. It's just kind of, the next one up with that said there's a scenario where most of the favorites come through and even in a loss it goes four or five mm -hmm. rounds yan does enough so i think if we can be real careful about how we're building lineups that include her that says if you're picking her you're kind of saying i'm expecting most of the chalk to hit not a lot of people maybe you play her with holloway and then assume all the other favorites hit something like that that's the way i would handle that probably not going to stack her with jang wiley but i would bet that Jan performs better than expected, even in a loss, does enough to make it to the optimal because all the other expensive fighters hit. So pair her with, you know, Bo Davis and Figueredo and Jalen Turner or something like that is how I would handle it. Yeah. I saw you shaking your head squirrel. Is that kind of what you're thinking or how are you yeah. handling it? I think so. Like this is, you don't want to pick Jan and then, uh, and then leave a bunch of sal salary on the table or something no. like, that, like that. Um, you know, you're, you're playing her for, the fact that she's 7,000 and she could go five rounds. Uh, she could fit that Alexa Grasso spot, right? Of, of uh, you know, I'll play her thinking that maybe she puts up 60 something and yeah, all the favorites went out. Like Bo Nickel gets that first round finish. Uh, Kayla Harrison gets a first round finish. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, Jalen Turner, you know, and then, well, maybe, maybe on, you know, puts up, uh, you know, 60 something, 70 in a loss, uh, you know, really high paced, he goes five rounds. Uh, but maybe she's, she wins the fight, too. And she's actually another fighter. You know, she's got a 20% chance of winning the fight, uh, according to the odds. And I think we've got her ownership 
uh, about like 13%. It's like it should be higher. I can see probably on the screen there. <laughs> um, my, yeah, my 13%, problem. <laughs> yeah, 13% projected ownership. So, like, I don't know. Like, what's the scenario where she wins her fight and is not on the winning line? I mean, I guess if, like, Holly Holm puts up a big score and Cody Brundage puts up a big score, yeah. maybe Jan, you know, wins her fight, but she doesn't have to win. What are you That's doing, a long shot scenario. You're drinking early. The mimosas flowing early, getting ready for 300. That's not going to happen. Right, but yeah, exactly. exactly. She, 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 any form of a win is going to be very good. And let's not, you know, forget that Wiley has been finished in the first round before. Um, both these ladies have been. Let's be fair. I mean, Jan has been dominated and should have probably been finished in the first. But there's equity to finish. There's pace to that fight. I just hope it's not like, you know, respect each other and, and distance strike. Do not let it be like the Esparza fight, right? Like, that that's not good. But there's a bunch of fights we haven't even talked about. Like, we, we got to get cracking on some of these ones that maybe are sneaky. And I feel like there's some leverage spots, too, right? Like, the fights I'm talking about. First fight of the night, Figueredo and Garbrandt. The Turner and Moicano fights. And then Oliveira and Zarukian, right? Like, these are three fights, guys, that... I think really are going to be interesting. They're not all the same type of fight. I'm just kind of putting them in together because they're they're grouped together in the pricing. But Figueredo, Garbrandt, I think you're looking at finish equity. I don't know if you're going to look at um, strictly any wrestling in that fight. You know, first fight of the night, set the tone, man. Go out there, try to bang. It's so hard to get behind Cody Garbrandt from a macro standpoint, Billy, because the guy's been hurt so many times. Figueredo, you know, moving up did, didn't look bad. I was a little worried at what he would look like. He looked pretty good. I just to worry about the pace of that one, like pure volume striking. But I mean, there's finish equity there. We know about the Turner fight. Turner's fights are usually binary. He scores a zillion points in the first round, or he's giving up the takedowns. And that's a perfect matchup for Moicano mm -hmm. if he's able to get those takedowns. And then I'm going to talk about, I love Charles Oliveira leverage. And Zarukian, it's it's hard to ignore. I mean, plus 200 Oliveira inside the distance. Zarukian favored at like plus 100 inside the distance. That's got car wrecks type of action written all over it. Is Figueredo and Garbrandt the odd fight out there? Because I feel like even that fight has two knockdown upside. I, I do think so. I think that one is Figueredo or bust just because we've kind of seen Garbrandt reinvent himself these last couple fights. Like he knows his chin isn't what it used to be and he can't just stand there and bang, but he's reinvented himself to a super boring distance fighter trying to win minutes. Like, I don't know exactly what he put up against Trevin Jones, but it wasn't great. He's the one fighter down there that there exists an edge case that he could win his fight and not make it in the optimal lineup. There's just somebody last week and I'm blanking on who it was who won their fight and scored like, 44 drafting points or something. Morano. Yeah. Like I could see that style of fight from Cody Garbrandt. So that one's Figueredo or bust, but everyone's going to make fun of me for this take. Sarukian versus Oliveira is the fight I've been most excited about since they announced it. Like I've got my BJJ belts behind me. I'm a huge grappling nerd and we've got the Russian style wrestling and takedowns and top pressure against the Brazilian submission game. I love it for DFS too, though, because Charles Oliveira is going to accept takedowns. He's never been a guy who even wants to defend takedown, much less has the ability to. But then he's throwing up submission attempts. Sarakian gets annoyed, backs out, lets him stand back up. We could see seven or eight takedowns from Sarakian, or Armin overcommits to those takedowns, stays in there, thinks he can beat him up, and gets tapped out in a minute and a half by the most dangerous submission fighter off his back in the company. So people seem to be missing that one, and I think it's – due to the proximity to Holloway and Gaethje, because they're right next to each other. It's hard to click, you know, Charles Oliveira for $100 more than Max Holloway, but that fight's got a ton of upside, and it doesn't mean you can't play the BMF fight with it as well. Absolutely. Squirrel, those particular three fights, how are you handling it? And like I say, there's, there's some fights that are just odd fights out. I feel like these ones, Turner has an incredible inside the distance uh, line and prop behind him. Yeah, so actually, I think that the Jalen Turner fight and the and Moicano is probably going to be a little bit under owned. Um, like both of those fighters have pretty good odds in relative to their price, uh, in relative to the fighters around them for for a finish. So that's a, a fight I'm interested in. I think people are going to be overlooking Moicano entirely. I think he's like the, he was the next like fighter up for my for my underdogs article. Uh, I think that uh, 
yeah, I think Charles Oliveira is going to be an interesting test case for like how many people are using projections versus how many UFC fans are out there. Because I think he's yeah. got more finishes than anybody else in UFC history. I think we've got him for like what 14% projected ownership as a big underdog. I think he's won like, 12 out of his last 13 fights. Um, I don't know. <laughs> like I, I understand like why the projections aren't that high. I think you've got to be over that that uh, you know 13% mark. Uh, yeah, I think Cody the Pierre, you know, the first fight of the night for Gardo and um, and uh, Cody Garbrandt. I agree. Like Gar- Garbrandt's one of the underdogs in this range, and I'm not really that high on. Um, so I got to probably be at or under the field on him. Uh, he might go for here. takedowns. Might might because yeah, that was what bailed him out. But he doesn't have the pitter patter. He doesn't have peripherals that score well. Yeah, and I just I I think you're I don't think he's going to win the fight. <laughs> so it's always, <laughs> it's always hard to, to you know pick the fighter that I, I think is going to lose um, unless unless it's a potential five round volume fest. You know, um, see so yeah, I agree. Figueroa though is interesting because he's got like a thirty percent chance, nearly thirty percent implied probability from the odds of a first round win, and we've got his ownership at half that. Uh, it's that's an interesting case, and I want to say that I want to be over the field, and I do want to be over the field, but then that you get to the Point of like you're just saying you want to be over the field on everybody um but yeah. maybe probably in like the large field tournaments especially like the largest field tournaments probably taking some of that bow nickel ownership very reluctantly and like putting it to the figure because i think he's going to be under own. absolutely yeah this broadcast is brought to you by roto grinders there's never been a better time to sign up for roto grinders premium with nba pga college basketball just ended but that's Okay, because we have hockey, MMA, and MLB. Get yourself a six-month combo subscription at an exclusive price of $469.99. That's a savings of $250 instead of buying all six individual months of combo premium. You can also give combo a test run with our three-day pass of $19.99. For those looking to test the waters before diving in, check the link in the description below for more information. And... Like, there's just a ton of sports out there to play, guys. We love it, and we love our MMA. MMA is growing, but I'll tell you something that's really interesting is um, these these showdown slate. We never talk it. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy that now that we've got this filled, all right, uh, the big GPP, people are going to be wanting more action. If you were going to captain one guy, tell me, because, you know, the show's winding down here. One captain to kind of surprise us. What captain are you going for, Billy? I don't know if you've ever ever played it. 1.5x the uh the the points and salary for the fighter. Who are you gonna be captaining out there? I think given the salary constraints here, I really like Sadiq Yusuf against Diego Lopes. Mm-hmm. Uh Lopes, we were talking about him earlier. He gets his submissions his first round, you know, with the minimum score. He's never even attempted a takedown in the UFC. He's been matched up with people that kind of allow him to grapple even without getting takedowns. Super Sadiq's not going to do that. I really like him at his price point. You get him in there as a captain, you've got a ton of salary left over for everyone else. On the higher end, you know, I was just talking about, I like Sarakin. He's just a little bit cheaper than those premium plays, so you can fit more around him. But I'm going to be big on Sadiq down there. I'm running into the same thing you guys were talking about. I can't be higher than the field on everybody. But Sadiq, especially in that captain format where – if you can find a winner below 8K, it's such a huge differentiator. And he's one that I, I like. I bet him as an underdog, gave out that pick this week. I think he's a good DFS fighter. Definitely a guy who's going to go for that 300K bonus because he's sending money back to his family and all that stuff. So all in on him in that kind of format where saving salary is such a premium. It is. And I know we don't talk about it, but Squirrel, I love myself some captain. If we imagine a captain mode for this entire slate, like, dynamic dynamic crazy fun card if you were to have it but i know you don't play it would you play it today and and who would your captain be yeah i might i might get some lineups in there i think the captain because like because it salary is such a concern i think you gotta go max holloway like you put max holloway in the captain spots um you're 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 not gonna get like zero points right (laughs) um so (laughs) that lineup is live no matter what then you know you do go on max holloway now you can afford bo nickel and a bunch of other favorites uh, like it's tough to put Bo Nickel there in the in the captain spot, right? Because one and a half times the salary. Um, but Max Holloway opens things up. It's gonna he's gonna give you some points. Um, and then if he wins that fight, yeah, you know, then then it's bananas, right? Like then he's yeah. probably putting up over hundred points, and you know you're knocking off the Justin Gaethje ownership at the at the favorite price tag there. So yeah, I, I'm probably gonna go Max Holloway. He's got like a forty percent chance of winning the fight. 
I'll tell you, nobody wants to go here. It's off of the bow nickel. Kayla Harrison, go in there and get your takedown game. Look, make it look like those scrubs you were beating up on the PFL screen. You know, she has elbows. Mark Coleman's in the crowd, going to be giving the BMF title out. Bring those elbows, Kayla. D you can use them now. PFL, you couldn't use them. But how? Uh, let me just ask, Kayla Harrison, does she score over 100 points, guys? What do you think, Billy? Can she? She absolutely can. But it's really, what is Holly? Is she working her takedown defense? Because I feel like 10% is just so low. We didn't even hit it. I had to circle back to that fight because we didn't hit it. I love that fight from a fan standpoint. I just want to see how that judo works, but I don't think she gets there. Like Holly Holmes' greatest attribute is the ability to suck the fun out of any MMA fight she's involved in <laughs> and oh, oh, limit the oh. scoring for both her and her opponent, right? So it's really hard to work those throws and stuff when your back is on the fence. It's great when you've got her back on the fence, but when you're the one stuck there, I don't think uh, Kayla Harrison's going to have a bad score. And there's, there's some edge cases here where she's working her takedowns and home gets right back up, so she racks them up. But, no, I with all the fighters there, we can't be overweight on everyone. That's one that I'm okay to avoid. And if, if I lose the slate because Kayla Harrison put on a career best, you know, career-defining performance, I'll be okay. I'll sleep okay after that happening. And usually the UFC bring in these talents from, uh, you know, PFL, one, et cetera, squirrel, and they put them in a spot where they're not going to shine. This certainly looks like a 50-50 spot where they're like, all right, well, we have a long in the tooth, Holly, potentially shoot her up the rankings. Well, how are you going to handle it? Because, again, we didn't talk about it, and I do think it's going to be important because, like, if Harrison scores one or two takedowns in the first and gets a four-and-a-half-minute finish in the first round, you're going to be, like, pulling your hair out, like, oh, my God, she just outscored Bo Nickel. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um I, we kind of talked about the, the difficulty in finding like Kayla Harrison statistics, um, you know, but yeah. I it went back to like her last PFL fight. Um, it was, it was against a former UFC, a younger girl, but um, Aspen yeah, she, yeah, she went to, uh, yeah, yeah. Lat. Uh, she went to scored that well in, you know, with the, the, the points she put up in the, the PFL fight. Um, and yeah, Holly home has a way of suppressing points. Um, you kind of, you have to roster it if you're doing a bunch of lineups. Um, I think actually, you know, I think we've got our projected it. We were talking about earlier, you know, Kayla Harris was projected to be like 10% and you were saying it's gotta be higher. I want to roster it at more than 10%, but probably less than 20. Um, so I think like somewhere in that range is appropriate. If she, you know, goes out and does, she gets that four and a half minute, you know, first round finish racks up a lot of points. Um, then, you know, you're still alive, still got something to watch for the rest of the card. Um, but I just, I think of the fighters that are priced up, in that range i think she's the one least likely you know probably from like jalen turner you know you know probably from diego lopez up uh she's the one least likely to put up like a sleep breaking score yeah i mean wait until we see the classic holly Holm head kick you know she's she's going in for the takedown and she's out cold like don't do it holly just not not on this card right billy you're laughing it's like that's what's funny. Final takeaways, Billy. What do you got here? Because it is a tremendous card. Maybe a bold play, a couple picks, and uh, where to see your stuff because we got a couple hours, you know, 6 p.m. lock. Yeah, I think one of my my bold plays, I mentioned Sadiq Youssef. Really like Anato Moicano down there. Don't think anyone's going to be on him. But if he gets through that first round, and it's going to be a scary, scary first round against Jalen Turner, even if he's not getting takedowns at his salary, he's also a high-volume striker. He gets on the mic and screams that he wants money after all of his wins. If anyone's going for the 300K bonus and selling out for it, it is Hanato Money Moicano, right? So he's one of those guys that I, I do think bumping up that bonus means a lot more to him than it's going to mean to Wiley Zhang, who's already getting points on the pay-per-view or whoever else. So that's my big take. I want to be way overweight on him. I think Jalen Turner gasses himself out. I don't know how Jalen Turner keeps making 155. He's He's got to go up to 170 at some point here. He's... He's the biggest man I've ever seen anywhere near this weight class. So, again, going to be holding my breath real hard for about five minutes there, but he gets through that first round. I think Moicano is going to win the fight outright and end up in the optimal lineup. Plus, Moicano has a new baby brother coming. Uh, <laughs> don't you I don't know if you remember yes. that one, Squirrel. Oh, yeah. His 62-year-old uh, his, uh, dad just had yes. a baby. Yes. Great, great genes. Congratulations, Money yeah. Moicano. Final takeaway from – your side of things, Squirrel, because I, I think Billy kind of nailed it. It's like these 
these fighters, the the Jim Miller, I'll, I'll group Yusuf in there for you. Yusuf, all, uh, Miller, Oliveira, Holloway, Moicano, everyone's trying to figure out how to handle this. And it's difficult, let's be honest. Yeah, like don't be afraid of the underdogs. I actually just think of something that every interview this uh, on, on this card, we're going to have to deal with fighters like <laughs> making their case for why they should get a, uh, you know, <laughs> performance bonus. But uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's, it's going to be a great card. Yeah, I, I agree. Like that, that kind of middle lower price range is going to be really tough to figure out. Like I'm not so high on the, you know, Cody Brundage, Holly Holm, but um, you know, the, the underdogs priced all the way there from, you know, from Jan to, um, you know, up to like Yuri and the, the $8,100 fight. Uh, like everybody's got a, a case for, you know, winning and breaking the slate. So no, uh, not Brundage. Yeah, not Brundage. Yeah. But everybody from Jan up, I think has got, has got a case for it. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Don't be afraid of the underdogs, and it should be a great card. I think everybody on the uh, conference got a question besides Brundage. I mean, that's saying a lot, guys. But enjoy the UFC 300 that is finally here, and we certainly hope that a Roto Grinder is up there at first place. I hope there's a unique as well that wins so it's not just a split in a chalk slate. But if we don't win, we certainly hope you guys do. We will see you guys in two weeks.